Conducted in secrecy and with the potential to make democratic decision-making irrelevant, we examine the concerns about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the deal that some call NAFTA on steroids. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. This week saw the beginning of the 15th round of negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, or the TPP, in Auckland, New Zealand. Led by the U.S., its supporters describe it as a free trade pact that would expand U.S. exports. But critics say trade makes up only a small part of what's being discussed. They argue that the pact will grant far-reaching rights and privileges for corporations and permanent constraints on government regulation. So far, 11 countries are taking part in the negotiations. The US, Canada, Mexico, Peru, Chile, New Zealand, Australia, Malaysia, Brunei, Singapore, and Vietnam. If approved, the TPP would have implications for a whole range of areas, including access to affordable medicines, food safety, and labor rights. It could even revive elements of the hugely unpopular SOPA Act, which placed restrictions on the internet, and was defeated in Congress. Participating countries would also be forced to alter their domestic laws to conform with TPP rules, something critics of the pact describe as a corporate coup d'etat. Failure to comply would result in countries being brought before a special court working outside domestic legal frameworks. What's more, the three years of negotiations have been conducted in secret, with just the delegates themselves and 600 corporate representatives privy to what's being discussed. The little we do know about the TPP talks come from a document leaked earlier this year. However, much remains under wraps, causing concern amongst legislators and activists in the countries involved, including here in the US, where the secrecy contradicts President Obama's consistent promises of assuring everyone has a fair shot and plays by the same rules. The negotiations over the Multinational Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP Free Trade Agreement, lack transparency. The U.S. Trade Representative denies members of Congress and the public access to the classified text of the agreement. This policy of secrecy undermines public trust and denies members of Congress the opportunity Congress has historically been afforded to provide input on trade deals. According to Public Citizen's Global Trade Watch, the U.S. Trade Representative has consulted with over 600 mostly corporate advisors on the context of the classified TPP text while continuing to deny access to policymakers whose constituencies will be greatly affected by the Trans-Pacific Partnership. From what has been leaked of the TPP, it is shaping up to be worse than NAFTA, if you can believe that. The North American Free Trade Agreements legacy of deregulation, the outsourcing of American jobs, and the undermining of environmental and health laws is legendary. So why is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement so secretive? With me to discuss this is from Auckland, New Zealand, where those uh, latest talks are being held. Laurie Wallach, the Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. And here in the studio, Celeste Drake, trade specialist from the American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO. We did ask the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to be part of our panel. Uh, both declined. We also were rather hoping for a statement. We did submit some um, questions in the hope of getting a written, some written answers, but we didn't manage to get those either. This could just be time constraints. But actually, Laurie, um, it isn't easy often to get the usual cheerleaders for, quote, free trade to come on and discuss the TPP. Do you think this is partly because there is so much secrecy or is it because they're quite concerned about having an open debate about this sort of thing? I would say probably part of their strategy is to try to quickly finish a deal without much public discussion or debate or awareness because given the details, it would not do well to have the public looking at the threats of higher medicine prices, unsafe food and other imports, and job offshoring that this agreement would likely result in. Right, and we'll go through, uh, hopefully step by step, some of the um, elements of the TPP that we do know about. But interestingly, 
uh, Celeste, the AFL-CIO, the, the umbrella union group that you're, you're a part of, I mean, they do have access to the, to the text. In fact, you have access to the text. Is that correct? I do. I, I'm a cleared advisor, and we get to see the U.S. proposals before they're final and give input and say, we would change this around. We don't like this proposal at all. We wouldn't make it. And then the USTR goes ahead and changes USTR it. USTR being U.S. Trade U.S. Representative. Trade Representative. Right. And we don't know exactly what's being proposed at the table with the 10 other countries. So does that fill you with hope that uh, the concerns of the AFL-CIO are being represented at these talks? Then? Not necessarily. As we like to say, they listen, but they don't necessarily hear. And we know by their public statements that they, this really isn't looking to be a radically different trade agreement and that it will generally follow upon the model of prior free trade agreements that we don't think have worked out well for U.S. workers at all. All right, well, as I said, we are going to go through what we do know about... I mean... Yes, go ahead, Laurie. Just to jump in on that, I mean, one of the things that's dramatically different with this agreement is there, I would say, have been tiers of access or not access for outside advisors, but Congress has always been able to actually see the text. So Congress could see, for instance, what ultimately was submitted that, that Celeste has given input to. There are 600 cleared advisors. About 30 of them are non-corporate. So Celeste and some other union folks are a handful of environmental and consumer groups. The majority of those those private sector advisors are business. But in the past, Congress could go to a secure reading room in the Capitol and actually look at the texts, both what the U.S. was proposing, but then also draft texts that actually put what's on the table before Congress. Because this will become binding on the U.S. Right, so, so and is, this time around, there's a huge knockdown, drag out fight about lack of access even for Congress. So, so the chair of the Senate Finance Subcommittee on Trade, who's overseeing all this, he's not allowed to see the text. Uh, he protested and protested, and uh, he was apparently invited that he could go downtown to the ca to the office of the trade representative and have access with the private sector advisors in their room, but they wouldn't have the normal access, the special access for Congress in the Capitol. Is that or constitutional the there? And in. Uh, well, he, he put in legislation, he, he would probably contest whether it is, but he put in legislation making clear that all members of Congress and their security cleared staff should have access. You know, this gets to the question of why so secret. The trade representative, the top U.S. trade official, Ron Kirk, in a moment of candor, told Reuters, when asked about this conflict between the administration's touted transparency and this process, he, he, he reflected back on the last time there was a massive NAFTA expansion negotiation, the free trade area of the Americas. And when ultimately that tax draft was made public, there was so much objection in so many countries to the outrageous provisions that the USTR noted, when we made it public, it couldn't be finished. Right. So the top U.S. trade official is saying the reason to keep it secret is because if the public knew they couldn't finish it, that's worrisome. Right. Well, I mean, there was this leak then earlier this year, and we do have some, some broad brush details of the sort of things being discussed. Well, we'll quickly just go through some of them now, but then we'll go into the more detail uh, one by one in a moment. Um, the critics say, from what they could see from, from that leak, um, the TPP would essentially transfer sovereignty from individual governments to the corporate sector. Corporations could challenge laws that protect labor, consumers, the environment, or food safety if they interfere with corporate profits. The TPP creates private international tribunals to hear cases run by corporate trade attorneys who serve as judges and would be empowered to order governments to pay unlimited amounts in fines. It would extend pharmaceutical patents that keep competitors out of the market and allows pharmaceutical companies to keep costs high and limit poorer nations' capacity to afford life-saving generic medicines. It shields foreign investment capital from domestic laws, essentially deregulating uh, big finance even further at a time when there are calls for more regulation. Um, it would also undermine internet privacy rights by forcing service providers to hand over private internet data without privacy safeguards and restrict uh, internet freedom of speech by criminalizing some web activities that are now considered commonplace. Celeste Drake, I know that, you know, on the pain of prosecution, you can't tell us, you know, how similar the latest drafts are, but is that broadly, I mean, what, what you understand the, the parameters to be? Or? That's a worst case scenario of how far it could go, but even if it was word for word, exactly like the most recent trade agreements with Korea, Colombia, and Panama, that's bad enough. That's a model 
that does make gen access to generic medicines um, more difficult and more expensive. It does promote offshoring of jobs. It doesn't adequately protect labor rights, environmental rights, human rights. So the, just the existing model is a problem. And if it goes farther in certain areas in ways that are bad for working people, then it's a disaster. Laurie, there's nothing to, is there anything to, to make you believe, well, hang on, this is just some crazy extreme vision that was presented in June and things have, you know, now, now people are, you know, talking, you know, sort of trying to be more realistic about what's, what, what creates an equitable and fair society. Well, the different texts that leaked, that you've summarized there, include an investment chapter, and that was actually the composite chapter. It had brackets where the disputed text was. But what you basically read is the basis of the agreement and those core fundamental aspects of the corporate tribunals where the people acting as judges are also the same lawyers who later will sue the right. government for a corporation. The unlimited fines, all that is unfortunately well, what's going let's on. I've been talking to negotiators here. Let's begin with those investor state tribunals then. These are effectively extrajudicial courts. Um, I mean, they suggest that international firms have no need to abide by domestic laws. Is it clear why companies are so keen to ignore domestic law, especially given that many of these countries have pretty respected judicial systems? Laurie. Well, the, those particular rules basically are a dream in the sense that they provide greater rights for firms at offshore jobs from the wealthier countries to the poorer countries. So, for instance, um, all of the normal risks or costs for racing to the bottom for lower wages are taken away. Those rules promote offshoring. But also, if you are a big international mining company or an oil company and you want to escape liability for the damage you do, this is a total boondoggle. The problem is there are a whole series of cases under this regime, so it's not speculative. Almost $3 billion has been ordered by tribunals just in the U.S. free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties that have that privatized corporate justice system. And it's not over the normal business you'd expect. It's not the government expropriating, taking someone's land or factory. The payments have been sent out over fights where corporations attack environmental laws, zoning rules, regulatory permits, forestry policies, and toxic spans, either the ban gets reversed and or the corporation gets paid. It's very outrageous. So, so the, she had just just yeah. to add some examples. So, for example, there's a threat of a challenge right now in Canada over a moratorium on fracking while the provincial government studies the environmental effects. There was a case that was lost um, because the local government in Mexico would not allow a permit for a toxic waste dump. So these are the kind of challenges, and they're the kind of challenges that could happen inside the U.S. that our domestic companies couldn't make. They'd have to use our domestic systems, but they're also the kind of challenges that are used in developing countries to attack their attempts to protect their people and protect their water and air. So it's not that a, an international company and is in saying it's being discriminated against um, as regards its local competition. It's simply that a law protecting the environment or, or, or labor rights is, is likely to disappoint an investor's expectations or affect the value of an investment. Is, is that basically it then? Yes. I mean, the rights are very broad in these tribunals, given the conflict of interest there, have interpreted them even more broadly. But to give an example, for instance, just recently, one of these tribunals ordered the government of Ecuador to pay a total of two point three billion dollars to the US oil firm Occidental over what Occidental had a contract for exploiting oil in Ecuador that said if you sell any part of your rights without government approval your contract is voided seems reasonable they went and sold 40 percent so does the company own the government owe the government for violating the contract no the company went in and said we know that we broke the contract, but that was unreasonable because we have foreign investor rights. And the tribunal ruled in favor of the company and is making the government pay them for all their lost future profits as if they hadn't violated the contract. So and these tribunals then, they, they're adjudicated by lawyers who actually rotate their roles from being judges to being advocates for the corporations. Is that correct? That, that, the, that is correct, and I'm, I'm sort of nodding because Celeste is a great expert at this, uh, and I don't want to take all the time speaking. But yes, that is the case. And in fact, sometimes they're in the big 
structural conflict of interest, but they're even direct conflict of interest. There's a dreadful case with Argentina and its water system, which was privatized, and then during the financial crisis, the water was cut off to Buenos Aires. They took back control of the water system. The Vivendi case, one of the judges actually was on the board of directors of a bank that was invested in the company Vivendi. She didn't disclose the conflict. They ruled for the corporation and ordered Argentina to pay them. And then there was the one limited appeal, the very limited appeals, and the tribunal ruling was allowed to stand even though there was a direct financial conflict of interest. So, Celeste, I mean, clearly then these sort of structures are already in place then yeah. under, under free, quote, free trade agreements that are in place. So is the concern here um, that this is sort of um, the TPP then further establishes this as the international norm for, for, for trading standards? Is that why the TPP is, is particularly concerning? Well, absolutely. And because the TPP could be the last free trade agreement that the United States ever negotiates. It's proposed to be a dock on agreement so it functions similar to the WTO in that you've got a set of rules new countries can join the established set of rules and it's not completely clear to us yet again because the text is secret and not finalized um, whether Congress would even have a vote on new countries coming in so if we set these rules and this investor state dispute settlement is put in place with the extreme model that we have opposed from Korea to NAFTA um, as new countries come in they will simply join a really bad agreement. It's sort of, I mean, and they, if they want to trade with the U.S., I mean, this is, I mean, they, they do, they have, they have no choice then. I mean, this is just, right, this exactly. is just what's in place. These are the rules. Um, but, but what's so weird about it, though? And uh, also, we can... Laurie, go ahead. I was going to say, we can see from the leaked tax that actually the proposal for this investor state system in TPP would expand even beyond what is a dreadful system in the past agreements under which this record of bad cases has already come forth. So there would be more kinds of matters that could be taken to the corporate tribunals. For instance, uh, public-private partnership contracts to run a utility, procurement contracts, even concessions for natural resources in countries, as well as having other kinds of substantive rules. For instance, a ban on the use of capital controls right. or financial transaction taxes to try and stop speculation exactly the opposite direction of what the world consensus has headed post-financial crisis is needed. Well, this is what's so confusing, then. Um, it doesn't seem to be in the interests of the governments who are, um, who are uh, negotiating it. And, I mean, you mentioned offshoring of jobs, Laurie. I mean, President Obama, you know, he just won an election where, you know, the topic would come up and he would say, look, we've got to stop privileging companies uh, who offshore jobs. And yet, or actually, perhaps you can explain, how, how does the TPP then... Um, benefit those who offshore jobs and, and what you know what might that mean for US jobs and, and why would President Obama then be going full speed ahead with this? The investor rules that we were describing guarantee a certain kind of treatment if you leave, a minimum standard, which includes compensation for regulatory costs and actions of the government that could undermine the expected profits of a, of a foreign investor. As well, they avoid the foreign investor having to rely on the domestic courts. These corporate tribunals, which are so favorable to the companies, become the substitutes. So most of the costs and risks of offshoring are taken away. You literally create an incentive to leave. So in that sense, it's a direct promotion of offshoring, a much bigger problem than, say, the tax loopholes that President Obama has focused on fixing in domestic law. As useful as that would be, that would not outweigh the damage that would be done with this kind of an agreement. So how is this total conflict occurring? Well, to a large degree, it's the secrecy. If the public had more focus on what was going on and the Congress were averring to the details, I suspect that those parts of the agreement wouldn't be allowed, and maybe we'd actually have a real trade agreement. Right, but the focused, president knows it's on going on. exporting U.S. goods, not jobs. So, Les Drake, I mean, why, why then is Obama, despite, I mean, he knows he wants to, you know, he, 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 the unemployment rate's rather important. He knows, and <laughs> um, he knows that the investment provisions in particular are a problem, because in 2008, when he was campaigning for president the first time, he talked about needing a review for extraordinary investor rights. Right. And yet... Specifically these sorts of Specifically issues, these actually. sorts of issues, right. and we haven't seen... Um, his administration did a long review of a, the U.S. model BIT, Bilateral Investment Treaty, which is essentially the investment chapter as a standalone treaty. And what came out, which is public, is largely the same exact bit that we've been negotiating. So we haven't seen much change there. And, and it really is a conflict. And we at the AFL-CIO, on behalf of all the working people of the U.S., are really 
keep encouraging the administration to take another look. Right, but it's not as if when um, they're simply just, you know, they're they're sleepwalking through this, Laurie. I yeah. mean, aren't the U.S. negotiators the biggest cheerleaders for some of these these particular uh, elements in the TPP? Well, this is the dichotomy. The U.S. negotiators behind closed doors are pushing an agenda that conflicts with what President Obama and his cabinet officers say is their domestic agenda goals, job creation, more affordable medicines, a healthier environment. And at the same time, increasingly, there's official opposition raising. So for instance, the National Conference of State Legislatures, that is of the 50 bodies, many of which are Republican controlled, has passed a formal policy this past summer saying they would oppose any U.S. trade agreement that has the investor state foreign corporate tribunal system. You've got many members of Congress, Democrats, Republicans alike, having sent very severe letters to the administration saying you can't do this, you can't do that. 160 members got on a piece of legislation that laid out what future agreements should look like. That's basically the antithesis of TPP. Yet, and this is why I focused on the secrecy, the quiet, the inability to get the other side to engage in a proper debate, as you saw trying to get them to talk today, the secret texts. It appears to me that the goal of those in the administration who want to get this done before there's a debate is to speed it up behind closed doors, lock it in, and then try and sell it, no matter how falsely, as if it's about trade and export expansion. Laurie, I'm mean, just very quickly on this idea of the cognitive dissonance of the Obama administration. This, the, the issue of pharmaceutical costs, a key to Obama, Obamacare and negotiations about Medicare and Medicaid and so forth, and yet this would effectively tie his own hands then on this topic that he knows he needs, he needs room to move. It's a perfect example of the conflict. It's a two-prong attack here with U.S. negotiators doing big pharma's bidding in a way that conflicts with the Obama administration's domestic goals. They're trying to have rules in TPP that would extend patent terms, the monopoly terms, that would increase prices, as well as set up new rights for pharmaceutical companies to challenge medicine formulary pricing decisions. Those are the bodies that are used in Medicare and Medicaid, as well as in New Zealand and Australia's national health care, that tries to negotiate better prices with the pharmaceutical companies and decides what they will and will not reimburse for. So if there's a good generic, they don't go for the monopoly drug. Both line of attack is being led by the U.S., and right now every other country has stood up against. The U.S. hasn't moved. All right, so we'll look, we've only got like two minutes left. We've just been handed a statement from the U.S. Trade Representative. It's just been emailed to us. Uh, it's very long. Here are the interesting bits that I can see just uh, at first glance here. Firstly, uh, the transparency and inclusiveness of these negotiations are unprecedented. Uh, at every negotiating round in the, uh, uh, as, as at every negotiating round in the U.S., stakeholders have been invited to be on site at the talks to interact, interact directly with delegates. See, that's interesting because it's true. I mean, the AFL-CIO is involved. And actually, it does make one wonder whether the AFL-CIO should be, should well, be involved, actually, in some of these things. We interact with... Uh when we're there, I'm, I'm obviously not in Auckland right now, but when we're there, we interact with delegates to the extent that they will allow us. We have to make separate appointments and have them come and meet with us. And right now in Auckland, the uh, community stakeholders are not even allowed in the building where the negotiations so are do happening. Do you not think you're giving it much more respectability then, though, by being one of the stakeholders so that they can say this sort of thing? Well... They can say it and then we tell the truth. Why would we lock ourselves out from right. having information that is potentially okay. vital? I've only got uh, one minute left now. Two. And it's very useful. Yeah. Well, very quickly, there are a lot of misconceptions about the way TPP and all our other trade agreements interact with governments. Nothing being negotiated would prevent our government or any participating government from regulating the public interest in the financial sector, in the public health sector, with regard to safety or the environment or any other regulatory area. Nothing being negotiated would give any arbitration body the authority to overturn or enjoin any government measure, even one that violates the agreement. The neutral international arbitration panels that can be set up under the agreement have no power or authority to direct changes to any federal, state or local entity, period. Uh, uh, Laurie, you'll have to have the last word after that. Well, that is a whole pack of weasel words. The, it is true that you can't overturn a law, but you can slam the government with hundreds of millions of dollars in fines, and the fines are ongoing, as well as trade sanctions until they change the law. Moreover, the binding part of the agreement requires every country shall conform their domestic laws, regulations, and procedures 
to the attached agreements. If you don't, you go to the tribunal, you end up with trade sanctions or fines until you change the law. That's the bottom line. That's what's in the agreement. Larry Wallach, thank you very much. Celeste Drake, thank you as well. Thank That's you. all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.